Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless the Lord. Father, you have been so faithful to bring us this far through 24 chapters of the Gospel of Luke. Thank you for teaching us and growing us and just giving us your word that we might understand and know you more, Father. And I pray that we would respond in faith to your word. And it is in the matchless and awesome name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Excuse me, I think I have a little nutmeg from my coffee stuck in my throat. Uh, maybe somebody could hand me a little bit of water. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome. Um, I'm glad you could join me for this last Gospel of Luke. I'm excited to dig in. I want to give you um, just a couple updates on MOVE ministry uh, going forward since this is our last Gospel of Luke. This will also be our last time on Zoom. If you're joining us on Zoom, um, we're going to now transition to being exclusively live on Facebook. So you'll be able to find us there from now on. Um, please, if, you, if you're not on Facebook or if you can't log in at the time that um, we'll be meeting, uh, just go ahead and find us on YouTube and please subscribe because the more people who subscribe, the easier it is for people to be able to find Move Ministries. Also, um, the next study that we're going to be doing is Acts. Um, it's also called the Acts of the Apostles. So um, Luke, Dr. Luke, the great physician, um, he wrote a two-part series, the Gospel of Luke, and Acts is the continuation of that. So we're just going to go right, it just makes a lot of sense to just go right into Luke's second word. Um, and we are going to start about 40 days from now in the end of October. And so be looking on Facebook for some updates. I'll be sending some ladies some emails um, to let you know what's going on with that. Also, some of you who started Luke with us know that um, this time through study, we had a study guide and we will also be having a study guide for Acts. So I'll be getting that together in the next couple of weeks. And um, if you will be wanting an Acts study guide, just send me a message and let me know and I will make sure that you get one. I only charge for the, um, the cost of printing and binding. Last time it was like six or $7 for, um, for one of those study guides. And so, oh my goodness, it is with just such great excitement and anticipation that we get started with the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> It was um, almost a year ago exactly that 25 women packed into my house to start this uh, Gospel of Luke journey. And so um, about a year ago, we started like the third week of September. And so here we are bringing it to fruition um, in, uh, in September. And so I'm just, I'm just so excited and, and just so in awe of how God has just faithfully led us through this study. So we were in chapter 23 last time we were together and chapter 23 covers the three Roman trials of Jesus. Remember he was first taken to Pilate by the, the Jewish, um, Jewish leaders. Remember they kind of thought they, you know, presented it. Like we're <clears throat> doing this great favor by um, bringing this man who uh, was misleading the nation to Pilate. And so once Pilate found out that Jesus was a Galilean, he said, ah, not my problem send him over to Herod. And no, this is the same Herod who had John the Baptist beheaded. Herod was lo looked at Jesus more as a mag magician and was wanting to see some of the miraculous things that, that Jesus did. He was wanting to be entertained by Jesus. People look at Jesus in all different ways. I, uh, my husband and I were watching, um, it's called the American Gospel, Christ Crucified. And this woman actually said, claiming to be a Christian said, I look at the Holy Spirit as a genie in the bottle. And I just gasped when I heard that because I thought he is not a genie in a bottle, just waiting to do your will. And, and, and that's exactly what, what Herod wanted is, is for Jesus to just do whatever he wanted him to do. He would just rub the, the lamp the right way and pop, he would get his, uh, three um, wishes. And so Jesus is sent back to Pilate, uh, yes, Pilate, and uh, once again, Pilate proclaims him completely innocent. And so, uh, but he offers this compromise and says, you know what, I'll have him scourged. And remember that scourging is like, literally the purpose of scourging is to remove the flesh from the victim. And so finally, Jesus is, is paraded through the streets of Jerusalem and is led to Calvary, Golgotha, um, the place of the skull where he is 
crucified. And then it is, it is there that we witness this amazing miracle. He is numbered among transgressions, one on the right and one on the left. And, and at first, um, we noted from the other Gospels that it says that both of these men were, were mocking Jesus. And, and there's some, something happened, some miracle of the heart happens in one of these criminals where he, instead of mocking Jesus, he turns and he repents and he now begins to rebuke this other criminal. He calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus, asks him to to remember him in his kingdom. And the Lord Jesus says to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Verse 44 says it was from the sixth hour to the ninth hour that everything went dark. And it is at this point that Jesus says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he breathes his last. It wasn't the Romans who killed Jesus. Jesus gave up his spirit. And so Jesus is buried by a man named uh, Joseph, a righteous man who had not consented to this plan. Um, he puts Jesus in his very own uh, tomb. And we see in verse 56 um, that, I'm sorry, that first it was the um, nearing the Sabbath day. And so they hastily buried the Lord of the Sabbath into the tomb. And uh, verse 56, they being these women, returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And on the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. Now let's get into the gospel of Luke chapter 24. What a blessing it is to be here this day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. First, uh, chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So these women rested according to the commandment, but as soon as it was light enough for them to see, when it says early dawn, another translation will also say a deep dawn, um, they go to finish the work that they had started. These women had followed Jesus and served Jesus in his life, and they were going to do the same in his death. They were going to continue to minister to them. The Gospel of Mark tells us that um, these women were, were kind of arguing and, and, and discussing what what are we going to do about this massive stone that has been rolled in front of the, the, the tomb? How are we going to even move that? That this was the problem they thought that they were going to encounter when they came to the tomb. And so who are these women? Now Luke chooses to tell us who they are in verse 10. So if we look a little further, we see that it's Mary Magdalene. Remember, we met Mary Magdalene in Luke chapter 8, verse 2. She was uh, had seven demons cast out of her. Make a note of this, too, that um, all four of the Gospels say that Mary Magdalene was a witness of the crucifixion and also the resurrection. It's always interesting when all four Gospels make note of something. Uh, Joanna was with them. Joanna uh, was in Luke chapter 8, verse 3. She was healed of evil spirits. She was a follower of Jesus. Remember also the thing that was interesting about Joanna is that her husband was a steward for Herod. He was in charge, Herod, he was in charge of his, um, of his uh, finances. And then the last uh, name we have is Mary, the mother of James, and then there were also some other women. So all of these women are going to the tomb expecting that their problem is going to be that they can't move this stone. What is the problem they encounter instead? This unexpected problem. There's no body. This is not the problem that they thought that they were going to have. So their intent was to come to this tomb was to, um, to uh, uh, place all of these different spices on him and to make sure that he was properly wrapped up. It's interesting to note, too, that um, Jewish people at that time would leave the bodies then for a year or maybe several years until the body had decayed, and then they would take the bones and they would put it in something called an asuary. Um, and so they're, they're just kind of following the Jewish uh, um, protocols. All right, let's look at verse four. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how you spoke how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. 
and they remembered his words. So these women are completely perplexed, completely baffled. Why is this happening? Where is the body? They expected to have to move a stone, not find a body. And suddenly there is this angelic appearance, these, these two angels. Um, here, here is something that we really want to make note of, particularly uh, when people claim that they have had uh, an, an angelic experience, that they have seen an angel. We need to look to the word and see, um, because there's several uh, um, uh, events in the Bible where angels do appear to people and what is their reaction when they do um, come across an angel. People are always terrified and they generally hit the floor. Okay, that is man's response to an angelic being that has so recently been in the presence of the holy God. That's how people respond. So when people um, talk about, you know, having been, you know, in heaven, having been with angels and they're floating around and jumping on clouds and all of that kind of nonsense, the Bible doesn't support that type of experience. So just be very careful to note that. And so these women have the same um, response that all other respond people do in, in the Bible and same um, from the first chapter of Luke when there is an angelic experience. And so I love this question that they ask uh, these women. It's almost a rebuke. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? We serve a living God. You would never look for a living person in a cemetery. This is absurd to them. We, this is a very important doctrine, a very important theology. A living God is the God that we serve. A living God is eternal and infinite. He is not ceasing. A living God is able to speak and think and act and command their people. A living God is so infinitely higher and infinitely better than any other idol that this earth could possibly offer, okay? Any idol of stone or wood or money or achievements or anything else. The living God. We, If we come to our idols expecting life, we simply can't get it or meaning. We will never find meaning in our good works. We will never find meaning in our rules. We will never find meaning in anything but a living God. So why are you seeking a living God among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. I can't hear you, but I hope that there is somebody out there who is saying, he has risen. He has risen indeed. Our Savior has risen. This is the hinge on which all of Christianity hangs. Had Christ not risen, it would have meant nothing. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ had not been raised, look at verse 17, your faith is worthless and you of all men are to be pitied. The, the fact that Christ has been crucified and risen changes everything. It changes everything. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were only acceptable to God if they were raised up. The fact that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is acceptable and, and that the wrath of God has now been satisfied is, is proof, proof is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, now look at verse five. I'm sorry, verse six. The angels say, remember what he spoke to you. Remember the word that has been preached to you. Here is why, the reason why they had fallen into doubt and despair and why so many of us fall into doubt and despair. Because we forget. Because we forget and we need to be reminded of God's promises and the sureness of his promises and the fact that we can rely on his steadfast promises. And he turns them, he says, look, remember, this was way back in Galilee. And this was in uh, chapter 9, verse 22. He also says it again in chapter 18. He says this, that the Son of Man must, there is that word, this is with certainty, this must happen. He must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He must be crucified. He and and on the third day, he will raise again. The fact that he has been um, delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified gives us a pretty good indication that he's going to rise again on the third day. Amen? Oh, and so what happens? These women remember his words. We have this like first sign of hope, right? That they had remembered the words that he had spoken. Verse 9 through 11. 
So they remembered these words and they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna, the mother of James and also the other women who were with him telling these things to the apostles. Interesting how Luke now switches to apostles instead of disciples. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. And so these women have this incredible um it, it, this incredible uh, thing, this incredible exposure and experience, I'm sorry, I'm fumbling over my words, with the with this angel. And what is their response? They respond in faith. They have to share what's happened, okay? When we experience Christ, when we experience a work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should not be able to keep that to ourselves. We should almost have to tell someone. We should almost have to say, Look what the Lord has done in my life. Do you know why? Because it brings glory to him. It brings glory to God. And that is the whole purpose for which we were created, was to bring glory to God. And so these women come back from the tomb, and they're going to tell the apostles what had happened. So in this first century culture, just remember this, that the testimony of women was not considered um, legal. They were not considered to be credible witnesses, um, because uh, it was thought in that time that women were too emotional, that they had a tendency to embellish things. They wouldn't be able to get the story correct. And, and I could definitely see that these women would, would burst into this room and say, you know, this is what's happened, you know, and all these men are like, what, what are you talking about? But Luke chooses to, to use these women as the first witnesses to the fact that something is happening. God is certainly doing something. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ is missing. And what is happening? Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, I want you to take a look at this word in verse 11. It says, these words appeared to them as nonsense. That word nonsense is actually a medical term. And it literally means like the babbling of a crazy person. So these women just seem like crazy people, okay, to the apostles. But look at these next words, verse 12. But Peter, I love those words. But Peter. He got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what happened. I want to read from the Gospel of John his account of how this happened, because I think it gives us some interesting details. Chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, and said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb and they are running to the tomb. I think the disciples were up in this upper room. These women burst into the room and they say, we don't know what's happened to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that Peter and John even waited to hear the story about the angel. I think that they heard the body was missing and they got up and ran. Peter's heart so desperately needed to see Jesus, needed to be with Jesus, needed to know that his story wasn't going to end in his denial. And so Peter gets up and he moves in the direction that he thinks that God is moving. So we know from the Gospel of John that they ran ahead to get to the tomb and they and they look inside the tomb. John tells us that, that Peter was literally inspecting every nook and cranny of the tomb to see what's going on, to find um, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they come upon the tomb, they see that... Um, there was no struggle in Jesus's burial cloth. His burial cloth was, it was as if his body had just passed through this burial cloth. It wasn't like he was kind of trying to wrestle through it and try to get out of it. We'll see that Jesus's resurrected body was actually able to pass through solid objects. The other thing that they found when they came to the temple was um, when a Jew would, would have been uh, buried, they would have put this burial cloth over his face. The burial cloth was folded neatly and put in a different place in the tomb. Now, had somebody actually came in to steal 
the body of Jesus, they would have taken this linen wrapping with them. This linen wrapping was a very expensive Egyptian cloth worth a lot of money, and they would have also taken that. And so um, it just gives us further evidence that his body wasn't stolen by, by grave robbers. His body was um, no longer there. Okay, so let's go to uh, verses 13 through 16. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them but their eyes were prevented from seeing them. So we have two of them, meaning two, um, two that were of, of the disciples. It's not of the original disciples. We're, we're going to get a personal name here. Uh, one of them was named uh, Cleopas. Um, and I, it, it is probably from him that Luke gets this very personal account of, of Jesus meeting these two men. But these two men, um, one of them who remains unnamed, they are undistinguished. Um, they are probably on their way home to Emmaus after being in Jerusalem for the Passover. And so uh, I, I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon, who's known as the Prince of Pe Preachers. I'm going to just share this with you. Uh, this is what he says about this encounter. When two saints are talking together, Jesus is very likely to come and make the third one in company. Talk of him and you will soon talk with him. And that's exactly what happens. You know, it's such a blessing to be able to, to be with other saints and to be able to, to talk about Jesus and know that, that he is among us as we speak of him. And so, okay, so we have these two, uh, two disciples that are traveling along the road. It's about seven miles um, outside of Jerusalem. And they're talking about the things that is that is first and foremost on their heart. And that is the events of the last several days, right? These men were probably with Jesus as he had this triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And now they were also... Um, at least had knowledge if they weren't witnesses of some parts of the crucifixion of Jesus. And so Jesus comes up and he's, uh, he's walking with them. They don't know that it is the Lord Jesus. Let's look at verse 17. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another while you're walking? And they stood still looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened in these days? So Jesus sort of butts into the conversation, right? And he's like, hey, what are you talking about? And it, it's very striking to me in the end of verse 17 that, um, you know, they're just walking and they're talking and suddenly this man says, you know, oh, what's, what's the news, you know? And they just stop in their tracks and they turn and look at them and their countenance is just full of sorrow, right? They are sad and, and despair. They have lost all hope. They had seen Jesus Christ on this, this track, right? This path, like, oh, this, this is the Messiah, right? This is probably what they have been convinced of. And, and now, now what, right? Okay. And how is it possible that anybody has been anywhere near Jerusalem and hasn't heard what has happened. Verse 19, and he says to them, well, what things? And they, it's almost as if Jesus is now going to make them um, confess the doubt that they're having. And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, make note that they call him Jesus the Nazarene here, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and in word in the sight of God and all people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find the body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But him they did not see. And so they sort of pour out their hearts to this man whom they don't know who he is about all of the events of, of, of the last several days. And so what are the things that they confess to knowing about? Um, they know that uh, this Jesus 
who is a Nazarene, uh, was a prophet. He was mighty in deed and word and sight and of all the people. Uh, he was crucified. They had hoped that he had been the one, the promised one, the one to redeem Israel. But remember, so many Jewish um, people at that time wanted to be redeemed uh, from Rome. Jesus had a far, Jesus and God the Father had a far greater act of redemption that they were working on than Rome. The Roman Empire would crumble within uh, several hundred years and it would be left to ruins and, and dust as it is today. But there was going to be a far greater redemption from that of sin and death. And so these men also know that Jesus was, had been, had been risen, risen from the, or I'm sorry, that, um, that others had um, had gone to the tomb and had found the tomb was empty. They had this hope and this desire that he was the one. Like I said, that they they felt like like Jesus was on this path. Like, oh, this is it, right? And then it's almost as if the bottom completely fell out of the plan that they saw. You know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you in your life. I have had this happen in mine where I thought, oh, God is taking me down this path. I can I can see what he's doing. It, it happened at a time in my life where people were beginning to ask me to speak and beginning to ask me to teach. And I thought, wow, this is what God is doing in my life. And I'm, I'm enjoying it and I'm excited about it. And I love being able to share Jesus with people on this on these different platforms and then all of a sudden, it felt like literally one day the bottom fell out and that was it. And I thought, wow, like, I guess that's over. Um, I guess that's not what God had for me. And in reality, it turns out that it is what he had for me, but he was going to deliver me from something so much greater. And he was going to turn me back around, get me on this path that he wanted me to be on and uh, continue the the good work that he had started in me. And so um, we, we're going to see that that Jesus didn't take the wrong path. He, he didn't do anything wrong. He actually did everything right. And according to his, uh, his father's plan, verse 25, and he, Jesus said to them, Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe, you know, if I'm feeling really sad and, and downcast, this isn't exactly the, the, the pastoral, compassionate response I would be expecting from the good shepherd, right? Foolish men and slow of heart to believe. That's not the response that I was thinking, but these men are in a very dangerous situation, and so would we be. At the very best, they have poor theology, and at the very worst, their theology is dead wrong and incorrect. He must correct their theology. And so he gets his, their attention. You foolish men. Not, and, and, and remember in the Old Testament, whenever they use the word foolish, it literally meant un, not knowing the scriptures. Do not know the scriptures. Why is your heart so slow to believe in all that the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary? It was, was it not necessary? These things must happen for the Christ to suffer these things and to, and to enter into his glory. Then, oh my goodness, we have the best Bible study ever. Look at that verse, verse 27. He explained to them, to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. In all the scriptures, Jesus went through this incredible Bible study on the way to Emmaus with these two disciples. Best Bible study ever, right? Okay, so look at this word explain. He explained to them the scriptures. What exactly does that mean? It's this, it, it, it literally means that he expounded by sticking close to the scriptures. This is a detailed, systematic teaching of the scriptures. And maybe this is just my opinion, but I do feel pretty strongly about this, that this is exactly what every good Bible study teacher does, is that you stick closely to the scriptures, simply expounding on them, giving meaning to them, and then allowing the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does, convict us and convince us and teach us and train us the word of God. Be sure of this. If hearts are soft, to the Lord Jesus Christ or the hearts are already open to the Lord Jesus Christ, cute little stories and funny little illustrations are completely unnecessary. All you need to do is have this 
word explained. I'm sorry, I get on my little soapbox here, but it drives me crazy when I get into a church and the sermon is filled of all these cute little stories. They're, they're these attention getting stories. And I understand that from a secular perspective in the secular community, that's what we're to do is to, you know, start with this engaging story and get people really listening. You know, what is more engaging to me than anything else? Please open up your Bible. You got me. You got me right there. And so this is what Jesus does. They obviously don't have a Bible, but he explains to these men. He expounds on the truth that is found in the scriptures. And I love it. Love, love, love that he starts where? In the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament wasn't written out for us. But so often we have new believers and we steer them straight to the New Testament because certainly that's all they can understand. and That's all they can handle. Baloney. I have been to India. I have sat with people who are devout Hindus. I sat with a woman who was on the verge of committing suicide and she found in the side crease of her, her couch a copy of the scriptures. Guess where she began? In Genesis. And as this woman began to read, she came across the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other God. When she read that, the woman fell down on her face, confessed her sin, and received the Lord Jesus Christ. It is all of Scripture points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to point new believers to the Old Testament. There's no way to really understand the depths of the sacrifice of Christ until you understand the meaning of the sacrifices and the necessity of the sacrifices in the Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament girl. I love the Old Testament. Jesus does things in scripture for our example. Follow his example. Go to the Old Testament. Go to Isaiah 53. Tell people, look, this was written 700 years before the Christ prophecy. It's prophecy, and it proves that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Okay, I shall climb down from my, my, uh, my daughter's laughing at me. I shall climb down from my, my soapbox now. Old Testament. Okay. Verse 28, and they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he was going further, but they urged him, saying, stay with us, for it's getting towards evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And so remember that hospitality is a, is a very important thing in this culture. And so it's getting late. It's getting to be a time where uh, travel is going to be increasingly dangerous. And so these men ask Jesus to stay with him. It's, it's kind of cool because... For, um, for the word stay in verse 29, when the men say stay with us, Luke uses a very common, the common word for the word stay. But when, it, when he says, so he, meaning Jesus, went in to stay with him, the word that he uses for stay there is abide. That gives a much deeper meaning to the word. Jesus comes in and he abides with them. The archaic definition of that is that he lives with them. He dwells with them. And this is where something miraculous happens. Verse 30, when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So Jesus comes in, he picks up the bread and he breaks it. Now remember, these disciples um, weren't at the Last Supper, so they would have not, um, Jesus, it, that would not, breaking the bread would not have um, given away Jesus's identity. But just as God had prevented them in verse 16 from recognizing who Jesus is, he now opens their eyes to see who he is when they when they're when they're talking to each other and say we're not our hearts burning within us literally as Jesus is speaking a fire is being lit under these men shouldn't we pray that this would happen to us that God would just open up our eyes to understand scripture and and in doing that just light a fire within us and under us to be able to share the gospel what an experience these two men had together what blessed fellowship as soon as they recognize who jesus is he vanishes why i'm not a hundred percent sure but here's what i do know this this would have created an intimacy between these two men that would have lasted their entire lives. All they would have had to say to one another was, 
remember that road? And they both would have just immediately been carried back to that moment. I, I think about friends that I have had just these deep and, and amazing spiritual experiences with. And just, just the fact like our, our friends, when we went to India for Christmas, whenever we say, remember that Christmas, we all have these, these um, images that immediately come to mind um, that, that just bless our fellowship. And so let's see, uh, verse 33 and they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the 11 and those who were with them saying, the Lord, no longer Jesus of Nazarene, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. So they've already traveled seven miles back from Jerusalem, right? And at this very late hour, they decide, we have had this incredible experience with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so we must turn about and go back to Jerusalem and find the apostles that were all gathered together. Nothing was going to stop them. The fire had been lit under them. And I, I just love that they say, it's the Lord. It's no longer Jesus of Nazarene. His identity is no longer a mystery to them. They know exactly who he is. He is the Lord. And I love too that it says he has really risen. Like this is really real. It's not that just he's risen. He has risen and he has risen indeed. And so they share with them what has happened to them. Can you imagine, just like picture in your mind, what the, the excitement in this upper room is, right? So they're all kind of gathered initially, and I'm sure there is this, just this sort of air of, of sadness and despair. And suddenly these women burst in and say, the tomb is empty. Peter and John take off. They come back. And then these, new dis these disciples come back and say, no, we have seen the Lord. And now look what happens next. Verse 36, while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, peace be to you. Oh my goodness. Now here he stands in front of all of them. And what are the words that he speaks? Peace be to you. Do you remember back in the beginning of Luke, um, his birth announcement? What was his birth announcement? Peace on earth. And now his first greeting to these people, shalom peace be on to you. Now, this is not peace as the world gives it. This is not this like hippy dippy peace kind of thing. This is peace with God, peace to you. This is, this is a quietness of the soul. The enmity between mankind and God has now been destroyed through the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ brought this freedom and this peace and this quietness to to mankind. Okay, verse 37, but they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. They basically freaked out. <laughs> and he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it before them. So it's almost as if in verse 38, like Jesus rebukes them. Like, why, why are you freaking out? Do you not remember? right? They were not remembering. They were not being able to recall the things that Jesus had taught them. And so um, we sort of see this multi-sensory experience in Jesus in that they were seeing him, they were hearing him, they were going to be able to touch him, and then they were going to see him taste the same food that he had tasted. I love this that he says to them, touch me. You can't touch a spirit. See my hands see my feet? Why does he say this? If you've ever wondered, does Christ's scars remain after the resurrection? Yes, they do. His scars will remain for all of eternity. They are his 
greatest trophies of grace, blessed scars. They will be there for all of eternity. We will be able to gaze upon those scars in his hands and in his feet for all of eternity to be reminded of the great greatness of his sacrifice, of the great length to which Jesus Christ went to redeem his people, blessed hands and blessed feet that bore the scars for you and me. And then Jesus ate the food, ate the piece of broiled fish. It was probably the same fish that they had just been eating. A spirit does not eat. Um, so it's fascinating to me that it wasn't that long ago he found these disciples sleeping out of great sorrow. And now he finds them completely unable to even believe what they are seeing in front of them because of their great joy. This great joy had actually hindered their faith. They weren't able to believe. All right, verse 44. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, Old Testament, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Okay, so now he goes about and he um, brings to brings to their memory, opens up their minds, all of the things that were written about Jesus in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, that is the entirety of the Bible. He returns to the theme of scripture. You know, I think if I would have been Jesus, thank goodness I'm not, I would have said, you know, I told you so. I told you all of this, but he's so merciful and he just points them back to scripture and what they could not grasp before they are now able to grasp. God gives sight to these blind men now being able to see what they could not see. It's just so amazing. And so now this is the message that will be preached is that Christ suffered. He rose again on the third day. Here's the message that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed. Here's our gospel. Here's our gospel message that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, when we believe on his name, confess his name, confess him as Lord, then we are forgiven. And this message would be universal. This message would be for all nations. It would start in Jerusalem, but it would go out into all nations. Verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. What is a witness? A witness is a, a um, legal, credible person who can testify to the authenticity of an event. We're going to see that being capitalized on in the book of Acts. And so it's sort of a warm up to the book of Acts. Verse 49, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And so he tells the disciples, look, you're to do two things. Stay in Jerusalem and wait until I send the Holy Spirit. This is this power clothed on high. They were not to do the work of the Father. They were not to go about witnessing until they had received the power of the Father. Verse 50 and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up to heaven. And so it says that he went out as far as Bethany, which is on the east side of the Mount of Olives. And just as he greeted them with this peace, he departs from them by speaking, by lifting up his hand and speaking this, this word of benediction over them, this word of commending them to the care of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance and give you his peace. And from now on, the Son of Man, just like he said, would be seated at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus's ministry here on earth was coming to a conclusion, but his ministry as our mediator, as our high priest, as our intercessory minister was about to begin. He is now the mediator between man and God. 
Um, and so we end with verses 52 and 53. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So I love that Luke ends right where he began in the temple in worship there in Jerusalem, and they are worshiping rightfully and understandably. The whole purpose of Luke's gospel was that it was written to a man named Theophilus in chapter one, verse four, to tell the exact truths of the things which he had been taught. That was Luke's whole purpose, is to just give a true and detailed account of the gospel, of the, the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, to make sure that we too would have a trustworthy account. And so now we have gone through all 24 chapters, expounding on each one into detail to give understanding and meaning to each one. And so what is our response? Each of us has to make up our own minds as to how we respond to the truth of the gospel and what we do with it moving forward. I pray that you might respond in faith. I pray that you would respond to this truth and to share it with others. Peace be unto you. And I lift up my hands and commend you to God's care and ask for his blessing upon your life. And we thank the Lord for all that he has done and what he will continue to do through the word in the book of Acts. I will see you in 40 days in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.